ladies and gentlemen, today we've got a very special guest joining us inside the booth. One take, Jake, 26 years young. He is heading to the IMAF World Championships in Serbia on February 11th, I believe. Jake, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thank you. Excellent. Tell me how this opportunity came about. We got the chance to speak with your teammate, Christian Ammons, the other day, and he gave us a lot of great insight into his personal experience. But how did this tournament fall into your lap? Well, so you probably heard from Christian uh, about how he came to get invited to the camp. Um, and uh, I kind of just tagged along. You know, we didn't really know what to expect. Uh, we'd done some research. We knew that they were locked in. They had people for the 170 pound and 185 pound weight classes. So uh, I thought, you know, maybe you go there and, you know, look really good. Maybe they let me spar the guys and maybe I'll take one of their spots or something. But they obviously didn't want that to happen. Uh, the guys that uh, were locked in, they're, they're good guys. They're, they earned their spots. They won medals at the Pan Ams. And uh, when I got there, I didn't really feel like sparring either. It was a long training camp and I uh, was pretty glad when – they only called uh, the phantom weights and the flyweights this far. So uh, I got the spot uh, to be the alternate at 185. Um, and then uh, probably like a month or so later, uh, right as I was getting ready for my uh, title fight in Fury, uh, they reached out and said, hey, there's the, the guy at the 205 spot can't make it. Um, if anyone knows anyone that would be a good fit, you know, let us know. And I said, hey, Cody, tell him I'm, I'm, I want it. Tell him I'm, I'm 195 pounds. I'm ready to go. Like I've never fought at that weight, but I, I'm sure I can beat all these guys. I actually, I scouted the 205ers way back because when Christian originally sent us like a flyer that was saying like, like oh, they're searching for, you know, people in these weight classes. I think at the time they didn't have a 205er selected. So it said 205. I was like, can I do that? And then I, I went and I, I bought the IMMAF.TV uh, subscription and I watched the fights of like the top guys in that weight class. And I was like, yeah, I could beat these guys. So uh, when the opportunity arose, I was like, let me add them. And they didn't say yes right away. I think they were hesitant to put a 170 pounder in the 205 spot. But after a couple of days, they were like, well, there's nobody else. So you got it. <laughs> so we might uh, as well uh, take Jay. Exactly. <laughs> Man, I mean, that's kind of crazy, though, never competing at light heavyweight and then entering, you know, a world championships uh, at that weight class. When you talk about how that affects you mentally, are there any nerves associated with that? Or is it more so just any fight anybody, any day, anywhere? I mean, I've kind of I fought like three times in the last five months. And if you count smokers, which, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's actually five times actually five times in the last five months, all finishes. So, you know, that process has kind of helped alleviate a lot of the nerves associated with fighting. Um, there's, you know, there's things to consider, right? There's things you think about in camp. There's always the worry of like, you know, you could get seriously hurt. That's a reality, but uh, I've kind of, I don't know. I feel like I've kind of made my peace with all those thoughts. Uh, they still arise, but I'm able to kind of compartmentalize them and, you know, I, I make it so that it if I'm if I have any nerves, I get them out like the week before. I sit there and I think about all the bad things that could happen, and then when I go in there, I feel like it's just time to perform. You know, yeah. it's not really uh, it's not really any different at a higher weight. And you know, in reality, I'm only kind of going up one weight class because it's same day weigh-ins. So, like I said, I would have been fighting at 185. Like the guy at 185, Anthony Rusco, uh, he's like exactly my size, pretty much. We both walk around like 185. 190 at the max but right now i'm obviously a little bigger to fight at 205 I'll probably end up going in there close to 200 so i'm not going to be too outsized and uh if those other guys are cutting a lot like if they're coming into the cage like 210 215 that process of cutting weight every day and then rehydrating is just going to take so much out of them i'm not worried about that and uh i've actually I've fought guys that are that size before in smokers or in the gym. And it's mm -hmm. not really as big of an issue as you would think. And uh, I mean, I guess we'll get more into this in terms of like the technical details, but the the style that a lot of these guys have is, you know, it's kind of a big man style. They don't move about the cage that well. So I don't really anticipate having to, you know, fight off too many takedowns or, you know, go head to head with them. I think my movement and my uh, cage awareness is going to be the deciding factor in these fights. 
What was your existing knowledge of the IMAF, you know, tournament and the organization as a whole before, you know, Christian and yourself were really approached with these training and these opportunities? Um, you know, basically none. Um, it was funny, actually. I was looking at tabology, uh, looking at the welterweight rankings in Texas after my uh, my fight in September at the first uh, Melee Fighting Championships. And I noticed the number one welterweight in Texas was not Bailey Porter, who's a behemoth, that's his nickname. He's a massive <laughs> dude out of, uh, I think he's he's from Texas as well, but he usually fights in Arkansas. He uh, has a win over a previous teammate of mine that I rank very highly, uh, Dallas Dodd. Anyway, he's number two in Texas, and the number one is some guy named Lester Batres Jr. So I was like, who the heck is this guy? And I clicked on his profile, and I'm like, this guy is a lightweight. He's fought at lightweight. He's actually fought somebody else that I know, Jonathan King, is a lightweight out of uh, Houston. And so I was like, what's going on here? And then I looked at his profile more closely, and I saw IMAF Pan American Championships. This guy had fought three days in a row. And I'm like, the heck? <laughs> and those were all at 170 because obviously he can't make 155 three days in a row. So I was a little bit pissed, actually. I was like, there's some lightweight that's ranked number one welterweight in Texas. Like, I'm going to fight this guy. And then I went out to camp, action and met him. And I was like, well, one, he is a lightweight. He's smaller than me. It's not really nice to pick on guys that are not in your weight class. And two, he's a nice guy. I enjoy training with him. He's really good. Um, and uh, I'll have to wait until Tapology figures it out that, you know, these these fights aren't really in the same weight class. You know, like, yeah. he's winning at 170, but I wouldn't call it welterweight, you know. It's like in 1FC, they have all their weights moved up. So lightweight in 1FC is actually 170 pounds. So anyway, that's actually kind of how I found out about it. And then like a couple of weeks later is when game day got the uh, the call and the, let him know that he was being invited to the camp. So it was kind of uh, serendipitous. Like we found out about it kind of randomly. And then yeah. a couple of weeks later, it was like, oh, shit, we're going. That's crazy. It all just kind of aligned like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, talking about Tapology again, it was updated just a day ago. You talk about the number one and the number two guy. You are currently the number three ranked uh, welterweight in, outside the amateurs in Texas following your second round guillotine choke to win that Fury uh, welterweight championship. How did that feel, man? Uh, I think I was ranked three before, so I'm a little bit pissed that it didn't that it just stayed the same. <laughs> I, you know, the guy that I beat was a number one middleweight, so mm -hmm. you know I would think that would count for something. But um, that the victory felt pretty good. I mean, it was when I go in there, man. I like I, I stop thinking. Like I hit the guy with the back fist in the first round, and I remember thinking like we, we were. We were exchanging, and he was coming close, but he wasn't really hitting me, right? He was, like, touching me, touching my shoulder, touching my arms, but he wasn't hitting clean. I knew I was hitting him cleaner than he was hitting me, but I knew it didn't really seem that way to the audience or to the judges. Of course, so I just yeah. remember thinking, i got to do something to make it obvious that I'm winning this round. And then the spinning back fist just happened. And I was like, holy shit, he's rocked. Let me, like, <laughs> let me hit him a couple Pounce more Pounce on him, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then when I hit him in the second round, I hit him with a head kick to a left straight. He got up, and I threw a big left hand at him, and he ducked in on a takedown. And I remember, like, I dug in, I got the position, I turned him to the fence, and then I was like, oh, I can actually finish this standing. And so I cranked it up and, you know, got the tap. And, you know, it always feels good, but it is always – it's kind of bittersweet because I, like – a lot of my teammates are really good on the ground. They have really good ground control, really good ground and pound, and I've been trying to work that into my game. And so I really wanted to get, like, a, just a dominant, like – kind of a brutal beat down on the ground, but he was able to get up and uh, I finished him with a submission. So, you know, I, I prefer to get knockouts. I prefer to get TKOs just because that looks prettier on your record. But right. uh, it felt great to, you know, go in there and everyone was saying, oh, this is a great fight. This guy's really good. And I, I went in there and I made it look flawless, you know, and that's what I like to do. And that's, you know, I mean, both you guys came in there undefeated. You obviously left improving on that record. And you talk about, right, the record looking pretty with TKOs. 100% finishing rate itself looks pretty looks solid. Yeah. You know, is that good. is that something that you work on within fight camps, like really searching for that stoppage, yeah. or is it just manifest? Ab absolutely. I mean, maybe one day there's going to be somebody that can, you know, survive everything that we throw at them. But especially at this level, I feel like you need to be getting those finishes all the time. Um we fight in a way where, uh, you know, Mike Tyson said, if you look for a finish, you can't win a decision. And I'm not a boxer. Maybe that's more true in boxing, <laughs> but I don't really think that's true in MMA. I think that 
you fight in a way that, you know, you, you just want to be a destroyer. You want to, you know, go in there and not let people touch you. You want to touch them from everywhere. You want to throw everything you can at them and you want to have the cardio, sorry, the conditioning to do that. And uh, the finishes are just going to come. You know, I thought yeah. a lot about early in my career when I was, I had sort of the traditional, uh, you know, approach to mixed martial arts early in my career. Um, I'm sure Game has talked about how we have kind of a different approach at our gym, but I was training, you know, kickboxing, jujitsu, kind of like trying to tie everything together. And like long before I even made my debut, I was really thinking, I was watching fights and I was looking at these fights that are really one-sided, but they don't get the finish. And I was trying to really, you know, break down like, why is it, what are they doing differently? How can you, you know, prepare for those scenarios and how can you like push the pace in order to make sure you always get that finish? Cause that's really what I want, you know? I made myself a promise that any fight that involves elbows is never going to a decision. So yeah. as an amateur, I can't throw elbows yet, but if I can make it out of amateur without any decisions, then no fight of mine will ever go to a decision except for my first smoker. That was like a two round fight, but uh, that's, that's kind of the plan. You know, I think it's definitely possible. So. Tell me about your background a little bit, man. Born in Brooklyn, obviously now training down in Texas. What was the process in, you know, traveling basically across the country to, uh, you know, pursue mixed martial arts? And what was uh, your your life like before training? Yeah, so uh, I'll start a little bit before the trip to Texas, just give a little background. So I started doing Taekwondo in middle school. Um, I only did it like a couple days a week and I didn't stick with it for very long. I got to like orange belt or something. Um, and there were like a lot of gaps in there. Like I, it was really inconsistent, but that gave me like a foundation for like, I knew how to throw side kicks and how to throw round kicks and how to throw back kicks. And I kept doing that. Like I got a, a bag in my room and I was practicing those. So that gave me a really solid foundation. Um, and then when I was in college, I joined a couple different clubs for uh, martial arts at first, I was in this club that was like more like traditional martial arts, but it was it wasn't like Taekwondo or Aikido or something like that. It was mm -hmm. like um, uh, it was a style called Penchak Silat, which is from Indonesia, which is like weapons based. A lot of these um, uh, people like commandos and stuff like that. It's very related to like Filipino martial arts, but a lot of like military people train in this. It's uh, knife based, weapons based, self defense kind of stuff. Um, and that was really cool because it, it was very philosophical, right? Because you can't, like, practice the knife, obviously. You don't get to train with a real knife in that style unless you've been doing it for, like, 10 years or something. Right. So you have to practice with, like, a plastic knife, and we have to do these kind of – we have to imagine, and we have to, you know, think about, oh, what happens if we're, like, unprepared and someone attacks us and that kind of a thing. And it's a lot about ending engagements really quickly, about – you know, getting out of danger. If multiple people attack you, you attack one of them, you get past him, you just you just run, you know, these kinds of things. And it, it was a lot of fun and it gave me a really, I think, unique perspective on martial arts because the guy who was teaching it was very, he was very undogmatic, you know, mm -hmm. like he was very open-minded and he was like, you know, these are the things that I know, but, you know, when push comes to shove, like some of this stuff goes out the window, right? It's just instinct and you can't really prepare for all of this. So uh, that gave me a really unique perspective. When I eventually started training other martial arts, I, I kind of knew like, all right, well, you know, jujitsu is really good for the ground, but it's not even a complete perspective. I was always very skeptical going in and knowing that like each different style was not like the complete truth. Um, so then I started doing the traditional kind of MMA path of Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. And I was training at a gym in New York called class one mixed martial arts, which unfortunately, uh, shut down over the pandemic. Um, but there I had a instructor, Luis Azarado, who's a legend from Brazil, a shoot the box guy. It actually is the first person to beat Anderson Silva. I beat him by yeah. decision way, way back. Um, he was the... Muay Thai and Jiu-Jitsu coach and then there was uh, another Muay Thai coach the owner Ken uh, Kenneth Eng who grew up in New York I think and was like he had a kung fu background but then he was uh, the like the the secondary instructor to Koban who was a Lumpini champion in New York so he had that traditional kind of kung fu background 
uh, associated with like a really like solid like sport Muay Thai background. He is probably still to this day the best striker I've ever met. The guy was like a robot. His technique was so precise, um, and he taught me a lot of really cool things. And I was just starting to get into MMA and trying to like mix things together. And I I could tell there was something that I was missing. Right there's you know, I was kind of realizing, like, I need an actual MMA coach. I need somebody who's gone through this process before me instead of just trying to be able to mix all the things together myself. And then uh, the pandemic happened, and I wasn't able to train in New York, so that's how I ended up coming out to Texas. Uh, I ended up at 10th Planet, which is uh, – initially, I was just there to train for ACC trials, but I took one MMA class with Cody Hofstadter, who's now my head coach, and he was showing some kind of, like, he was like in a ground and pound position and he's like, and if they, you know, block here, you take that, you put this behind your head you pin it to the ground. Now you're punching them. And my mind was just blown. I was like, wow, this is the first time I've been in an MMA class and I'm learning something that's not like punch into a takedown or like, you know, just a very basic like mixture of different martial arts. It was something that was actually like, Clearly, he's done a lot of thinking, a lot of work on techniques for mixed martial arts. And it was something that was not just a mixture of martial arts, but like a brand new martial art itself. Right. And that's how I ended up training out here. And I think that, you know, to relate it back to the IMAF, right, that level of depth, and that's something that Christian was touching on, is just not really present yeah. in a lot of, you know, those other types of schools. So yeah. in terms of, you know, predictions and expectations, right, level of competition, from y'all's point of view, ain't too high. I'm assuming the uh, the expectation is going to go in there and, and win over that five day tournament. Well, of course, the expectation is to win. If anyone's going <laughs> in there and not expecting to win, then they got a lot of problems they need to work on. Yeah, uh, but yeah. So, uh, like I said, I scouted the top guys in the weight class. Um, there's like some big heavy hitter Muay Thai guy from Sweden who came in like twice or third a couple times, and there's this Russian guy who it seems like he kind of only knows how to wrestle. Um, like he doesn't even do a whole lot on the ground. Once he gets them down, his cage movement is pretty basic. Obviously he's, he has a good awareness, you know, he's not getting kicked in the face all the time. He knows how to stay safe and get to his techniques. But, you know, even beyond like, it's not even enough to say these guys are like one dimensional, right? Cause even if you are like, a jiu-jitsu black belt and you've got like a couple like you know national muay thai championships i'm not really worried about any of that because in mixed martial arts like i said it's not really mixed martial arts it's just martial arts right. it's the only thing that separates this from a street fight is we have gloves and shin guards and there's rounds other than that you know like there's no reason to think of mma as like oh when you're on the ground you're doing jiu-jitsu you're not there's punches right. when you're standing you're doing muay thai you're not there's takedowns there's cage work there's all of this stuff and it's not even enough to say that these guys don't know how to mix it up because i'm not mixing things together i'm executing techniques and strategies that we've worked on specifically for specific scenarios you know like when i'm moving about the cage i'm not doing muay thai footwork i'm fainting i'm showing you level changes i'm able to come in from all kinds of ranges and angles with strikes, with takedowns, with, you know, whatever I want, you know? For sure. No, that makes a ton of sense. And so what's next then after the IMAF, uh, you know, what is the game plan for the rest of 2023? Uh, the next thing is probably going to be the Tiger Muay Thai tryouts, which for is sure. going to be, I think, in June. So we got some time to heal up and prepare for that. Um, not sure how many more amateur fights I'm going to have because it's going to be a pretty long record after I'm and I'll, I'll be nine and zero. Um, what we'll probably do is we'll do the, the Tiger Muay Thai tryouts and then probably chill for a little while. And then maybe towards the end of the year, get back into competition, probably go up to 185 and, uh, win some belts up there and then start looking to go pro probably, you know, around this time next year is the plan. Unless we decide that. to do IMAF again, uh, Christian has talked about that. Um, but it depends on what kind of offers come our way. You know, if uh, some big pro organizations want to offer us a fat contract, it's probably just going to go pro. Uh, I think uh, if we do IMAF again, I would actually want to do it at 170 and get myself like really lean and, you know, just uh, 
go through that process because I see what Christian's going through now to make 135 five days in a row. And I think that, you know, afterwards that might be, his body is, yeah. is just so optimized, you know, like it's, it's rough, but you know, for one thing now he'll be able to make 125 easily. And if I do the same thing, I'll be able to make 155, which is something that I don't really want to do per se, but I want to keep the option open. Cause when I go pro, it's going to be hard to like bounce between like 170, 185. And nowadays, you know, you got to be able to fight in two weight all. classes. You got to yeah. be able to show people that, you know, yeah, you just got to, you got to catch eyes. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, if there's an yeah. opportunity at 155 and there's not at 170, 185, then you're like, well, I, I might as well bounce on it, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because, you know, when you get to the big show these days, it's all about, about personality and it's all about, uh, you know, you have these guys that are like sitting around fighting once a year, waiting for their title shot. And I don't want to do that. I want to fight the top guys. I want to fight like five times a year, even as a pro. And, uh, you know, if I have to bounce around weight classes to get those fights and to get into the title picture, that's what I'm going to do. I love it. Last thing I got for you, Jake, it's a question about the hair. You got a lot of lettuce upstairs. What is, uh, what is the locks coming from? I gotta, I gotta know the meaning behind it. Uh, it's not so much meaning. It's just, uh, so I, uh, prior to this and sort of still, um, I was a software engineer. Uh, mm. so when I was in college, um, uh, like my second year, I didn't have the beard and whenever it would kind of grow out, it would get really like itchy and like irritating. And then one time I had a project to like delayed for too long and I had to work like four days in a row, just nonstop on it. And at the end of it, I had a beard. I just, you know, I worked, <laughs> I was too busy working to be bothered about, about the itchiness and to shave it. And at the end of it, I had a beard and I was like, no, I kind of like this. I'll just keep it. And then the same thing kind of happened with the hair. I, uh, I got it cut too short. I didn't really like how it looked. So I let it grow out. And then uh, I like couldn't remember where I got it cut. I didn't want to go to like another barber another shop place. And yeah. being like, hey, you know, don't cut it too short, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, I'll just let it grow out. And it went through a couple of phases. And there was a while where it was like not quite long enough to like pin back, but also too long, to like let fly free. So it was kind of annoying. It was hard to spar. But now it's long enough that I can like really tie it up. Pull it back. And, uh, it looks good and you know it's unique it uh the ladies like it it makes me recognizable <laughs> so so there's no, now. Yeah. no con. I think gotta... I'm probably gonna cut it after imath like yuri sure. prohashka he cut his hair after he won the 205 title so more of like a, a symbolic yeah the samurai move exactly <laughs> I love it. One take, Jake. Thank you so much for the time. Best of luck in the 2023 IMAF World Championships in Serbia. Can't wait to see you perform and bring that hardware home to Texas. Thank you for having me, brother. I'll see you. See you.